How's everybody doing? How many first time Drupal Conners? All right, that's what I like. So um, we're going to talk about cracking the shell, command line for Drupalers. Um, the great thing about this being the last session of the first day is that I can talk as long as I want to. <laughs> so usually this session goes about two, three hours. So just, just so you know. No, I'm kidding. Um, but seriously, there's a lot of stuff that I packed in here. I've cut out a lot of things over the few years I've done this talk and updated things. So uh, there's a lot uh, that we'll go over. And the idea is just to kind of whet your appetite, um, show you things that are possible, also to demystify a few things. Um, so, but before we get started, um, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Bob Kepford. I'm a lead architect for Media Current, and we, I'll tell you a little bit more about Media Current, but it's a great uh, Drupal agency that I've been at for about five years now, and uh, it's a great place to work. Uh, I also publish a weekly Drupal newsletter called The Weekly Drop. Yeah, nice. Got some subscribers. And uh, as a part of Media Current, I do a podcast with some of my coworkers there called the uh, Media Current Dropcast. And that's, fun. that's a fun little semi-regular podcast that we do. We just talk about Drupal. Sometimes we'll have uh, people in the industry on. We just had an interview with Wes Boss a few months ago. Um, and it's just we have, it's, it's not really that serious. We kind of have fun with it, but um, it's, it's fun. So some people like, I think we have a few subscribers, maybe two or three. Um, but anyway, so Media Current is the reason I'm here. Um, we are a full service digital agency that implements world-class open source software development strategy and design to achieve desired goals for enterprise organizations seeking a better return on investment. And I, Obviously, I do not work in sales. Um, I do work as a, a, on a dev team, so um, just bear, bear with me with, this, with the public speaking stuff. But um, in all seriousness, Media Current's a great agency. We do great work. Um, I'm really proud of some of the work I've got to do there. And if you're a developer and you're looking for a great place to work, um, hit us up. Uh, we have a booth, and I'm going to have the details for that uh, later on in the presentation. And as well, we have a party uh, tonight, and there will be info in the last slide on that. Um, and if you are looking to have some help with your website, um, come see me afterwards. Uh, we'll go to our booth. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to you. And uh, we do great work. Um, I might be a little prejudiced, but anyway. So let's get started. So first of all, what is the shell? And I'm going to ask for some audience participation. Um, if you don't really feel comfortable in the command line or in a shell or any of this stuff, raise your hand. Oh, see, I'm, I just now realizing this might be kind of embarrassing, but it shouldn't be. So it, are you, okay, let's, let's ask it this way. How many of you are, would consider yourselves a developer? All right, there we go. So all of you should be using the command line since we're doing Drupal and we all consider our, pretty much all of us developers. So let's, let's just forget about those fears about the command line. It's not that bad. So what is a shell? So a shell is just a user interface that allows you to access the operating system services. That's the simple version of what a shell is. Um, one, another term that you hear thrown around a lot more often nowadays is command line interface, or CLI. And applications have their own CLI, or websites have a CLI, like GitHub. Um, or a programming language might have a CLI. So that's just a command line interface, a way for you to interact with that application or that service by typing text commands. Um, so it's really simple. It's one of the most simple interfaces you can have with a computer. Um, but what are the strengths? Because there are definite strengths of the command line and there are definite weaknesses. And, and the, here, let's just talk about them real quick. So one of the strengths is it's light on resources. Um, the commands usually are pretty concise. It's scriptable, so you can automate things, whereas when you're working in a GUI, that's not always possible. Sometimes it is possible, but it's always more complicated if you need to do it. So those are some strengths. What about some weaknesses? Because there are definitely weaknesses. Um, the commands are not obvious, so you're not going to just kind of be 
intuitively typing things and figure stuff out. I mean, sometimes you'll get lucky, uh, but you can also really mess up your day if you just start randomly typing stuff <laughs> in your command line. So I do not recommend that. Um, it's really not beginner friendly, although when I started using computers, that was the interface um, back in the DOS days. Anybody remember that? So it's not, I wouldn't say it's beginner friendly, definitely not like a GUI is, but that doesn't mean um, we should avoid it. So why should you learn to, to use the shell? Because I do get pushback sometimes from even my coworkers that why do you focus on this stuff? Why do you use a shell? There's a GUI app that does the same thing or whatever. And this is, this is 2018, Bob, come on, get with the program. So I get that a lot. Um, here's my favorite response, it's a Unix system. We work on Unix systems. You never know when this knowledge will come in handy. Um, so the other thing I always like to bring up is that Unix systems have really won the war. Um, even Microsoft allows you now to install uh, Linux applications and command line tools on Windows, which are things I never thought I would actually say out loud. Um, so in my opinion, when it comes to the work we do the Unix-based systems have won the battle. Um, I mean, all, most of us are probably using some sort of Unix-based system to do our work. So there's a big, big plus there. And I've never regretted learning a command line tool, and I always like to quote myself at least once in my talk. <laughs> and I mean that sincerely. There are many things I have learned that have been a waste of time. I, I will just say, we'll just say flash. <laughs> So CLIs are everywhere, um, I mentioned earlier. I mean, this could be just pages and pages. Everything has a CLI. If it's cool, it definitely has a slick CLI with a bunch of cool stuff that it outputs. So there's your reason right there. We write PHP, we work with MySQL, we work with Drupal, we work with Composer. More and more we work with Node. We probably still work with SAS to some extent. And every JavaScript project ever imagined has a CLI or at least works with the CLI. So CLIs allow us to script things and automate things, and as developers, if there's one thing we love to do, it's automate things because we're lazy. And lazy in a good way in that we don't want to do mindless work. We want to actually challenge ourselves, so we want to focus on doing things that challenge us, not things that just mean punching buttons over and over and over again. So this is my main reason I like to focus on the command line, is I like to automate. And I like to customize and personalize. Now, these are two separate things, because you can automate stuff, and that works well for a team. But if you start personalizing things, then it gets a little different, because when you sit down at somebody else's computer, you don't know what to do. And I am definitely in that boat a lot. Um, not that I don't know what to do, but my fingers know what to do. My head has to catch up. So, um, but I will say that 99% of the time, I'm on my own computer, and I benefit greatly from the customizations I've made on my own machine. So I want to make my computer work for me is the main point. So this is a little bit of a dated demo, but basically it gets the point across. Um, what I'm doing is for a typical project, I'll have what's called a Tmux session, and it allows me to open up multiple terminals in different panes that can have applications running in them so I can kind of just have a dashboard to see what's going on right when I'm writing my code. So I've set up a Tmux session here, split it into multiple uh, terminals. I can look through my git commits and, and look at my history. Um, I have Drupal console all set up, ready to go, and this is all like in a script. I just have executed one command at this point. It set up my Drush aliases so I can just type Drush commands in different terminals and they will interact with a server or a local environment, and all of this is set up. Now, I just show you this because you can go this far. I'm not suggesting everybody do this. Maybe you have other things in your life that are more important. But I enjoy this, and this has been over the years something I've set up. So I'm gonna walk through a lot of this stuff in here, but not all of it. But as you can see, things are getting pretty serious for me in this environment. So. When I realize something is really valuable, I enjoy it, I take it pretty serious. Um, when it's code related, what do we do with code that we want to preserve a history of, that we committed to? What do we do with that code? Version control, right. And version control, as we all know, means Git. So we put it in Git, and on, if you go to GitHub, 
which is hilarious to me sometimes, I, just as an aside, I, I, I'm around quite a few newer developers, and they will use Git and GitHub interchangeably, which is fun um, for, for somebody who's been around for a while. But anyway, uh, dot files. So dot files are kind of the community's name for all the configuration that for all your command line interfaces and some of even some of your GUI apps. Um, so if you go to GitHub and just search dot files, you'll find tons of developers' configurations, and you'll learn all kinds of crazy tricks that people have come up with to automate their work or to configure apps in ways you never knew they could be configured. And so dot files are the, the stored configuration, and they always begin with a dot, or almost always. So that's why they're called dot files. And the reason they begin with a dot is so that they're hidden from the GUI file browser. So most, app, most operating systems, if you open, like in Apple, if you open a finder, you're not going to see any of your dot files. Uh, they'll be vis invisible. So, they're, so you can't mess with them. And they always live in your home directory. So tilde, uh, there's, there's a debate about how to pronounce this. I don't know if I said it right. But they always live in your home directory, which is the tilde. So what do I do? Like, that's, we don't really want to put our home directory in version control. Just FYI, that's not a good idea. Um, so typically what you'll see people do is they create a directory for all their configuration and then they symlink all of their uh, dot files to that directory. And there are tools that allow you to do this pretty easily. I don't use them because I started doing it before it became cool. I guess I'm a hipster. I don't know. I'm probably not a hipster, but anyway, if you have to ask, I guess you're not. Um, but this allows me to track them all in one, one Git repository and keep a version of it, and I can actually publish them, minor online. And, and the other nice thing about this is when I get a brand new computer, um, I can just clone that repo, and then boom, I'm ready to go. Like I have all my Git configuration stored, I've got my Vim RC all set up, I've got all my homebrew stuff. I'm, I'm just, it's just great. Um, if anybody's ever had to go through installing all the software that you had at your previous job's computer on your new computer, that's a day sometimes for some of us, so this saves, it saves a lot of time. The other thing I like to do is go and just steal people's ideas. If you go to GitHub, there's just tons of great stuff and you can go in there and I don't recommend copying anybody else's configuration wholesale, but it's good to look through and like, oh, that's a great idea. Uh, just, it's open source, so just like Drupal. Like we, learn, we learn from other communities, we learn from WordPress, WordPress learns from Drupal, so same idea. So, uh, a couple things. I don't know how many people are familiar with symlinks, but we'll just do a really quick, uh, really quick primer on this. So, basically, a symlink is just a pointer. Uh, so you store your file in location A, and you actually want it to look like it's in location B. So you create a pointer or a symlink to do that. And the command is really simple. But this is essentially how you can control where files actually live versus where the operating system can find them. And so that's kind of key to this whole thing. The other question that always comes up is what configuration do we want to add to our dot files? What kind of stuff do we want to configure and store? Um, and as my dentist says to me every time I go in for a cleaning, only floss the teeth you want to keep. And I'm pretty sure he stole that line, but he steals stuff liberally, so, including, well, I won't say it, but he's a dentist. So, <laughs> wow, I didn't, mean to, I didn't mean to offend dentists. Are we any dentists in here? Yeah, I didn't realize it till just now. No, actually, he's cool. Uh, anyway, so the shell. So let's get back to the shell. So we've talked a little bit about what, what dot files are and kind of how you would do this type of work. Um, what do we put in our dot files? Well, the first thing is what shell are you using? Uh, there are three popular shells, Bash being the one I use. It's kind of the old faithful. It's on every system pretty much. Um, and it works for me. You can customize it and improve it, but if you learn how to use it, you can pretty much use it on any system. Uh, there's some newer shells that have a lot of cool stuff built in. ZSH is one. I'm always on the fence about whether to use it or not. I've tried it, it's really great. Um, then there's a new, even newer one called Fish, which is even, has even more slick stuff. So I'm sort of sure some of you might have been familiar with these, but uh, definitely take a look at them. If you don't want to really build your own customizations, I recommend the, the latter two, if you don't like the bash configuration. Another thing we would store in our dot files is our environment settings. So 
the, the idea of this is instead of typing the full path to the command line application that you want to use, let's say Drush, for example, um, I would rather just type Drush. So in your, in your environment uh, variables, you, you can add these to your, what's called your path. And the path is just an environment variable on Unix systems, and it allows you to specify which directories are executable, executable programs. So instead of having to type the full file path, you can just type Drush, and it'll just, it knows where on your system Drush lives and it executes it. Another cool thing, and this is a really easy way to kind of get into customization, is to set up aliases in your bash RC file. Um, and I have a few that I use here. I have actually a ton, but these are really simple ones. Um, just if you find yourself typing the same thing over and over and over again, you know, why? When you can just shorten it. So why do I want to keep typing history when I can just type H? Um, another one is L, where I can just type that, and instead of getting L, instead of having to type up this whole long command, ls dash lhg, which is a really pretty way to look at all your files, I just type L. Another thing that is very useful is, is writing your own functions. And it doesn't have to be that, you don't really have to learn um, bash scripting in order to do this. I mean, this is a really simple way. Um, this is a function named take, which basically just makes a directory and will make it, well, it'd be easier if I just show you. So I just type take and then the file path. And, I, and make, what I'm trying to do is make three nested directories, one, two, and three. And what had just happened is it created all three of those directories and then put me in the actual deepest directory. So that, that's just to show that all, I didn't have to type all that command out. I could just type take and then an argument and it's done. So there are millions of applications of that uh, that you can do. They can be drush commands. They can be like commands to back up your database and move it to a specific directory. And once you learn how to do this, you realize like why wasn't I doing this before? It only took me 10 minutes to learn how to write a bash function. So a lot, of, a lot of potential there. Another one is SSH. And this one always cracks me up. Um, well, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say cracks me up. Um, <laughs> this one, I, I, I think I would just benefit from being around a sys administrator who would watch me type and just go nuts. So he would say, stop. We need to, we need to, we need to straighten this out. So SSH, how many of you have written or have uh, typed SSH commands to log into a server before? How many of you remember the IP addresses and the username and the port number? Or do you have to go look that up? Yeah. So there's a file in your, uh, and I don't recommend putting this in your Git uh, and storing it and putting it on GitHub. I may or may not have done that at one point in my life. Um, there's, no, there's no password in here, but there is IP addresses, there are port numbers, there are usernames. But you can, you can go in here, and I do this for frequently used servers. Uh, I'll just make a nickname for it, and that saves me from having to remember all of this stuff and type it wrong and possibly log into the wrong version of the server or wrong environment. Um, and also, it's nice just to have a written record of it, as long as this isn't things that are supposed to be kept secret. So privacy and security, as I said, do not put these on GitHub. You're just uh, exposing information uh, for hackers to exploit. So let's talk a little bit about Git. We talked about we store everything in Git, but um, Git is a powerful tool, and there are really nice graphical user interfaces that look pretty and allow you to do a lot of bad things. So be very careful. If you're just learning Git, please, there are plenty of tutorials online. Learn the basic command line command so you kind of understand what's happening. Because if you jump in and you just go straight to, say, we'll just pick on one, um, GitHub's application, yeah, most of the time it's going to be fine, and I don't even have a problem with people using it. I've used it before, but you do need to understand the basics of Git. So spend a little bit of time and learn that. You'll be very thankful for it. When things go sideways, you won't be freaking out as much. So it's, it's well worth the time investment to, to spend a, maybe even a day just learning more about Git when you have time. So listen or sorry, learn, learn to use these commands. It's, Git is, I like to say Git is, um, Git's like a good set of steak knives. Um, 
you can do amazing things. You can cut up some, some great food, and people will look at it like, wow, this is so well presented. But you could also lose a finger. So be careful. <laughs> Learn what you're doing, um, and just be careful. So Git configuration. This is where it's typically stored. Um, you can do all kinds of customization to it if you're in Git. Git is probably one of the tools I use most every day. And if I'm going to use a tool, I want to configure it. So I've, I've set up my global uh, excludes file to kind of have a default git ignore. I've customized my colors a little bit. I've set my default editor to vim so that it's not opening nano. Um, anybody? No? No? OK. Um, also, another thing you can do, if you don't like command line editors, say let's say you use Atom or VS Code, I think is what the cool kids are using. You can set that up here, so when you want to go git commit, it'll open Atom or whatever your graphical editor is. And that's very handy because you'll be surprised how many people have a hard time just quitting Vim. Or Nano, <laughs> really. Um, and I set up some other defaults. But you, you get the idea. You can, you can set up things. You can also do git aliases as well as you know, the command line aliases or git aliases. And, and I have a lot of these that, that I use because I just like not typing. Um, so. I have short names for my git commands, git log, and I have git lol, which basically gives me a pretty graph of my, um, of my log. I can do git ll, which adds the numstat and number of lines changed. I can do lola, and these are all in my, my, uh, my dot files, and I'll have a link later. Uh, and then I, there's one that I specific, really liked, which was to see how much work done I've got done in a day. I have an alias called git lolm, which is just my commits. And it just lists out all of my commits. But in order to you type those commands, I, there's no way I'm going to remember how long they are. Because if you look, they're really ridiculous. Like No one ever types these. If, if they do, they're a wizard. Um, I don't know how anybody would remember this stuff. So, yeah, another one uh, with Git is ignoring files. And there are basically three ways to ignore files with Git. Uh, you can do it per machine, which was the home directory thing I talked about. That's kind of your default. Um, per project, so a dot .git ignore. If you look at Drupal, the Drupal project has a dot .git ignore. And for the project, everyone that works on that project will have the same git ignore. And that file's actually committed to the project. So if you add something there, then it's ignored for everybody that works on the project. Uh, but there is another way to ignore files, which does not have that side effect, and it's excludes. So if you go to .git slash info slash excludes in your Git project, it may not have that file, just create that file. You can actually have a per repo instance ignores file. So let's say, for example, you use VS Code. And VS Code, um, whenever you set up a project, creates a .vs code directory in the root of your project, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> just like uh, P uh, PHP Storm does kind of the same thing. And then what happens when you're working with a team and they don't want to add that to the git ignore for the project? Well, you can just add that to your info slash excludes. And then it would be excluded for you, and you don't have to bug the lead dev on your team, and you can just ignore it. Um, so this is, there's a lot of uses for this. Another seldom used, I think, uh, Git feature is hooks. And a lot of times people use this in their deployment. And we're not doing a DevOps talk. This is all personal stuff on your machine. And basically what hooks are, they're kind of like Drupal hooks, if you're familiar with those. So whenever there's an, something happens, you can hook into that action and perform actions that you want. So you can run a command every time you do a Git commit. Or you can run every time a command every time you do a Git push. So you can hook into all these different commands. And so it's really useful. Um, you can check out that, uh, that link there. It talks about customizing it. Um, here's a couple of ideas of things I do with it. There's a pre, I use the pre-commit hook for, to do code, lint, uh, code linting. I have that set in my editor, but sometimes something will slip through. And this, is, this catches me. So who's ever left a debug statement in code and committed it? <laughs> yes. That was, that's some of the best case scenario things I've done in my career. Um, but this helps me with that. It, it'll, it'll catch that. And, and there's a link there. Um, that's a simple uh, Drupal-specific pre-commit uh, script. And I would recommend checking that out if you do Drupal work. Another thing which is very useful if you work on a team and you kind of need to share 
uh, a history of what you've done on your team is the post commit. And I run this, this is set up on all my repos. So basically when I do a commit, it's on my clipboard. The whole commit message is on my clipboard. And then when I go to the project management software we happen to be using, I can just paste that in there and I avoid typing it twice. So I just, it also encourages me to write really good commit messages because I'm like, well, I'm gonna use this multiple places so it needs to make sense and be complete sentences. And we all do that, right? We all, we, nobody says added changes. <laughs> if you're doing that, please, you will hate yourself in the future for doing that because Git is forever. So let's, let's try to, yeah, we've all done it, but anyway. Here's the problem though, a lot of times you forget to add these hooks, because you have to add them per project, um, and I used, to, I used to forget this. So here's where we're gonna go back to the git configuration, and then we're gonna basically add an alias called init. So in case you don't know, I mean a lot of us may be just starting off with git, but if you start a new project, you type git init to make a git repo. And so this is an alias that basically grabs a template file that I have, which has everything I typically use with my Git configuration. Um, so that's, that's a handy thing to, to use. And then I have a Git uh, template directory where I put all my hooks files and all that kind of stuff. And you can, you can keep this simple or, or as advanced as you like, but it's a useful tip. So that's Git. There are Git tools that make Git better. Because um, let's be honest, I, I really do love Git but it could be better. Um, one of the things that I like to use is TIG, which is a text mode interface for Git. So imagine how great some of these GUI applications are that work with Git. Um, TIG is like a command line version of that. It allows you to uh, do things that the normal Git CLI doesn't. Um, here's a, we'll just look at a quick example. So it makes it really easy to kind of go through the history of a project and then inspect different commits I actually use this to do most of my uh, change staging. So instead of uh, just using um, the git CLI and add, git add, a lot of times I will just run a command and then I can go through this interface because I like it better. So as you can see, like I'm basically staging some files, looking at the changes and then staging them for the next commit. Another tool I like, and this is just because I like pretty things, uh, is git HUD. And if you were like as a kid really in, into airplanes, like you'll know what a HUD is. Like I was the nerd that just went crazy over F-18s and things like that. So I love anything that can trick my mind into thinking I might be flying a jet. So I have to really watch it too. Um, but the Git HUD basically gives you a quick glance at what branch you're on, um, gives you some color in there and how many modified files. It's, it's actually, pretty advanced, so, and I, I can't explain exactly what's going on here. Um, we don't have time. <laughs> but it does give you a quick way to kind of see the status of your, of your Git project. All right, so we'll talk about Vim, and, and I have cut out most of the Vim stuff because not everybody likes Vim. Um, but there are basically two ways people look at Vim. There are the people that don't use Vim, that see Vim users, and they're like godlike powers over their code, and they can do things that just are, you look at you like, how did you do that with so many, so few keystrokes? But for the reality, the reality is most of us are here, or, or have been here. So, that's where I was. But, seriously, Vim is not easy to learn. So, there is no, we, we gotta quit shaming each other and stuff like, you don't know how to use Vim? Oh. Uh, we need to really stop that because it's just a tool. But at the same time, there's a reason why I use it as my primary editor and the main reason is, is RSI. And I had issues probably seven or eight years ago with that and realized that I had to change a lot of my ergonomic habits. And then I started looking at my keyboard and, and how I did stuff and I said, well, why am I doing all this typing? And one of my friends, who knew me really well said like, you know, you are like in the sweet spot for being a Vim user. He's like, I don't know why you don't use Vim. So I took, him to, took it to heart and I started learning it. But in serious, as Vim's been around forever, I plan on coding up until the point I can't type probably and maybe then they can have some other way to do it. But I, I love text editors and I used to switch all the time. Like every time the new one would come out, oh, I switched to that. And like I realized that that was just kind of like the new hot 
thing. I just wanted to be doing the new hot thing. And like, why am I doing this when I could just learn something that has tons of potential and I get investing in it over and over through the years and I'm not losing anything because it's all building on top of each other instead of me just using the new thing. It's also, I'm already in the shell. So I'm already in the command line a lot. I can just type vim and it'll open up my directory and I can start editing files. Um, another cool thing, it's open source um, and it's available on all systems. In fact, there's actually a fork of Vim called NeoVim, which is really, really slick. If anybody's a Vim user, check that out. It's pretty cool. Um, and it will never die. I think if we do have a nuclear holocaust, which I hope we don't, there will be two things left, cockroaches and Vim. Well, that's possible. And I love using the keyboard. I, I'm not a mouse guy. I, I don't like click, clicking around and stuff. Obviously, that's why I'm doing this talk. So yeah. So the, like always the question comes, well, can Vim do whatever? And the answer is always yes. Just like can Drupal do anything? Yes, it can do it. Should it? Maybe not. So that's, that's, that's subjective. But here are a few plugins. I'm not going to go through them real quickly. But if you do use Vim or if you've considered it, here's a couple or few that are uh, pretty useful for Drupal development. Um, we'll look at really quick at Vim Fugitive, which is basically a, a wrapper for Git, so you can uh, interact with Git. And I'm just gonna show one something real quick, Git Blame, so you can, everybody know about Git Blame? Yeah. So if you go to a specific line in a file, you can see who did that. Not, it should be Git Credit or something, but it's <laughs> Git Blame for some reason. The only reason you ever care about who wrote this stupid code is because it's broken, so I guess that's why. Um, but anyway, there's all kinds of stuff it does. You can stage files. Pretty much, it's a wrapper for Git, so you don't have to leave Vim to do your commits and stuff like that. Um, another one, and I, I, I'm, I really like Sublime Text. It's a great editor. Uh, is Git Gutter, which basically they stole this feature. The plugin writer just implemented it in Vim, which is another reason why I like Vim is because people look at what other editors are doing, like, oh, we should write a plugin for that, and they do. So basically, where your changes are in the file. Most modern editors do this. Out of the box, Vim doesn't do a lot of this stuff, which is great. Small feature set, but extendable to infinity. Another thing that people always ask about is, how do you do debugging? You know, I really hate PHP Storm, but I need to debug my code. And I don't hate PHP Storm, for the record. But if the only reason you're using PHP Storm is for debugging, I mean, and you like Vim, there's this client, and it works really well. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the whole thing here, but it gives you all the features of Xdebug. So if you need to um, step through your code, you need to watch a variable, you need to inspect objects, all that kind of stuff. Um, I like, I can't imagine not being able to do debugging, right, especially with Drupal 8. Um, so setting up a debugger, if you don't use Vim, whatever. Whatever editor you have, you need to get Xdebug set up. You need to do that because you will learn stuff that you never thought you would learn just by stepping through the code that you're running on your computer. And then there's this really cool project. Um, I've never met the maintainer, but he's very responsive. Uh, VimRC for Drupal. Uh, if, you use, if you write Drupal code and you use Vim, I would look at this. It may, Vim users tend to be a little pedantic, so you might not like every decision made in here, but it's worth looking at. And if you want a really quick and dirty way to get Drupal set up in Vim, this is a good one. And I'll skip that. So let's go to Drush. So we've been talking about kind of general stuff. Let's talk about Drupal specific stuff. So Drush is a tool we should all be using if we are Drupal developers. Uh, one of the things that I neglect to say a lot is that it makes it really easy to get a server going. If you have PHP installed on your system, you can just run a simple command and you have a local server running without you know, Vagrant or anything like that. You can download and enable modules, you can back up and import databases, and you can perform updates and much, much, much more. Uh, one of the things, you can watch the logs. And my personal favorite is logging in as any user. This is extremely useful, especially when you have a complicated site with all these different user roles in Drupal, and they have different permissions, and you want to reproduce something, so you can log in by running a simple command. You can log in as that user. So let's talk about Drush Serve. So PHP comes with this built-in web server um, that a lot of people, I find a lot of people, did, I, for years I didn't know it existed. Um, 
And Drush makes it super easy because all you type is Drush serve and it works. As long as you have your site set up and your PHP installed and stuff. But Drush aliases are a really cool tool to, um, has anybody ever typed Drush and then they get that message that says like, uh, I don't have the access or whatever. I can't remember the message, but yeah, you can't bootstrap Drupal. You just type Drush status, you get nothing. Um, and there are ways to go around. Most people will go CD to the default directory, which works most of the time. But when you have, let's say you have uh, three server environments and you have your local environment and you, you, know, you don't want to have to type out that whole long thing or SSH in, you can set up aliases. And I'm not going to go through how you set this all up. It's well documented in the Drush documentation. But you can set up aliases and they look kind of like this. You set up a file, and then when you, your command looks like this, so you'll name your alias, whatever. I'm really creative, so I said your alias. And then you type 